Welcome to the Real News Network. I'm Jessel Noor in Baltimore. In Chicago on Saturday morning, despite community protests and 10 arrests, bulldozers raised a community center known as La Casita, located on the campus of Whittier Dual Language Elementary School. Chicago Public Schools had attempted a similar move in 2010, and the community responded with a 43-day-long sit-in carried out by mostly mothers and their children. Local residents had long used the field house as a community center and during the occupation decided to make it into a library to highlight the fact that Whittier, a dual language elementary school that serves many students learning English, is one of 160 Chicago public schools without a library. They received book donations from all over the world. This is part of a story I filed in 2010 for Democracy Now! about the occupation at La Casita. Daniela Mencia is a fifth grader at Whittier. We normally call it La Casita, the little house. Um, we do a lot of things here. Some, the moms know, they learn their GEDs, uh, they earn them, they know, they teach them how to sew, they teach them how to make bracelets, and this casita is really powerful because they use it for lots of things. Eager to preserve the building they call La Casita, community members launched a campaign to remake the La Casita into a library. Again, this is 10-year-old Daniela Mencia. When they, I heard that they were going to knock it down, and, but the moms wanted to make it to a library, I, I knew that this was my fight. According to the Chicago Tribune, Chicago Public Schools said the building's structural problems made it unsafe and it needed to come down right away. Joining us now to talk about the latest from La Casita and its impact on the community is Gabriel Cortez. He's an assistant professor at the College of Education at Northeastern Illinois University in Chicago, as well as an activist. His research focuses on school community relations and grassroots participation in public school policy. Thank you so much for joining us, Gabriel. Thank you for having me, Jessel. So, uh, Gabe, you weren't actually present during the uh, destruction of La Casita, but you've been involved in this struggle for many years now, uh, and you're, you're close with a lot of the activists who were there at the time. Can you talk about um, what happened and what the impact has been on the community? Yeah, well, I've been involved ever since uh, day two of, of the occupation back in 2010, uh, in the fall, back then in September. Um, but what has happened, what happened this past weekend was it was a total surprise uh, community members, parents, students have been using the field house for you know, almost every day. Uh, from what I've been told, I wasn't there when, when they demolished the, the, the field house, La, La Casita. But uh, police, construction workers came through, a demolition crew came came by, while a dance, a nastic dancer group was, was setting up to, to practice at the field house. And they told them they had to leave the, um, the space immediately because they were going to search around and prepare for, for demolition. Obviously, uh, community members were, were horrified. Um, they were disappointed. They were scared. Uh, community members came out in support you know, for, for La Casita and reminding the police officers and the construction workers that there was a promise made by CPS, uh, Alderman uh, Daniel, uh, Daniel Solis, who's Alderman of, of, of Pilsen, one of the aldermen, who said that they were going um, to gonna, gonna keep up with their promise of keeping the space for the community members. So that did not happen. People feel, um, you know, there's no trust. Uh, who can we go to in terms of, lead, of leadership, right? So, so there's a lot of questions that are being asked. So although people are disappointed and scared of these tactics, um, now that the space is gone, what the new uh, um, strategy is, well, let's turn that space into a new building. If CPS and Alderman agree that that building, you know, was in poor conditions, well, now is a perfect chance to build a new a building that was that was widely used, much needed, you know, uh, at least uh, by community members and students. And why not build a new a new space? You know, instead, what their plans are to build a, a soccer field and an athletic field uh, that, that more, more than likely will be used by a, a private high school that's down the street. And um, the media often portrays these type of events, which are actually pretty common in Chicago and other places around the country, as kind of happening in a vacuum. Um, and they don't often discuss how this fits in to the much larger picture of the struggle for public education in Chicago. So, um, you know, just in the last 20 years, there's been uh, massive protests. You saw the, uh, the teacher strike last year, 
And even a um, little more than 10 years ago, there was a hunger strike in uh, the neighboring community of Little Village where um, people went on hunger strike just to get uh, a school built in their community. There was massive protests in the 80s to get um, local school councils. And a lot of people don't know that Chicago is the only urban school district where parents and community members and teachers have direct democracy in how their school is run. So, so Gabe, can you talk about how this really does fit into a much larger picture of community resistance and the fight for public education in Chicago? Right. Well, you know, just as you know, like the world is changing, right, as we speak. Uh, right now, uh, we're going from many pro public services, from education to, to health care, to different types of uh, city services are being becoming more privatized and education is, is being one of those services. Uh, for, as you mentioned, in the last 30 years, now we'll go further. Throughout the history of public education, communities have always been advocating for changes in their local schools from uh, from ethnic mites who, who wanted uh, Catholic institutions, right, serving their kids back in the early 1900s to uh, the, uh, the mid 1900s where African Americans wanted to learn about their own culture and have uh, African American uh, administrators in their schools and boycotts of like over 60,000 students in CPS back in the 60s during the Black Power Movement, right? And then uh, in the 70s, you have uh, the, the, the neighborhoods of Pilsen and uh, Humble Park, who were, which were growing Latino populations back then, who were advocating for, for schools that, that meet their needs and have administrators that understood the, the Latino culture. And then you have the, 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 the 1980s, which was really uh, a six-year citywide campaign to develop the, the local school councils. And this was under the leadership of, of the late, uh, great uh, Mayor uh, Harold Washington, right? He really was a, a, a different type of leader who, who really embraced these concerns, who brought in uh, the interest of the different stakeholders of, of the business community, the local community, the activist community, and the, and the educator community, and brought it together and said, you know what, well, all these stakeholders need to have uh, accountability, but also a vote on, on how these schools are going to be run, and more importantly, address the needs of the local community, right? So it took about six or seven years to, to push that through. Uh, after he passed away, it was passed through in, in Springfield, Illinois, and when the second mayor Daly, uh, came into office, he made a point where Chicago was going to become an international city. And we're seeing that today. Uh, neighborhoods that, that historically been uh, neighborhoods of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, migrant communities are now being replaced with, with young urban professional communities, right? And this is what's happening with globalization. We have a two uh, a two tire economic system. Now. You have people who are getting uh, well paid, working in financial uh, institutions, and you have people who are working who are working class. And if they don't get a high school degree or a college, you'll be lucky if you can have a a job that 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 will help you live a, a sustainable life, right? So that's the reality now. You have various uh, situations like that going throughout the city. Uh, more communities are, are coming together. And, and figuring out ways how we can support each other, right? Because this, this is a fight, uh, I believe, a uh, um, dialogue between CPS headquarters, uh, uh, the main office in downtown, downtown, and educators throughout the city has, has been totally detached, right? There really isn't any communication. Um, decisions are being made and they're just being enforced throughout the city. Um, so at the same time, Chicago has been a source of activism and protest. It's also been the testing ground for a lot of these reforms. Um, I remember when I was in La Casita in 2010, when I visited, um, they were getting support from all around the world. Um, and people were looking for inspiration and, and guidance from the parents at La Casita. Um, what's the advice that the parents and the community members at La Casita have for other communities that are going through the same struggles? And it's happening all over the country. You know, what I've learned from, from being involved with La Casita, and mind you, I'm there as an ally. There, there are leaders that are from, from the, the Pilsen area who I've learned so much from, um, is, is, to, is to build a network of allies, uh, be transparent with, with your decisions, right? Uh, uh, democratically uh, made decisions. And, and uh, one of the most powerful things that I learned from La Casita, even though it's, it's a predominantly Mexican school, Mexican neighborhood, uh, supporters from all over the city came came through to, to show their support. Uh, you had black folks, white folks, you had Latino, you had Asians, everyone from, from different social economic backgrounds came through and they knew that this was an injustice, right? So so building that support really helps sustain, right, uh, this this movement of, of uh, advocating for education and, and educational resources for this for this uh, low income community in Pilsen, right? Uh, what I can say is I know that uh, throughout the city, 
more and more people are learning about healing techniques through uh, restorative justice uh, 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 learning. This is learning about uh, how to heal from the violence that's taking place, how to build from understanding and, and, and then developing, designing new alternatives of, of how we can educate ourselves. Because even though schools are being dismantled, resources are being taken away, we still have to live life and we still have to develop an understanding of what's happening in this society, right? What I can say is that when you learn, when you actually meet with those from like Asita and, and other uh, uh, activists throughout the city, it's like, you know, you, you really uh, cherish and, and value communication and dialogue and learn from each other. What I can say about those who, individuals who, who make these decisions and have power, you know, listen, you know, you know, be in tune with your compassion because you know what you're doing and it's hurting so many people. Imagine being a kid from, from uh, the Pilsen neighborhood and your school is being attacked and your family members your community members are being criminalized for vying for your education. I mean, that's a lot of pain you're inflicting in people, whether you know it or not. Um, if you cannot listen, I, I, I ask for those who, who are in those circles, who, who, who are around these individuals with so much power, to, to, to intervene. <laughs> it really is an addiction, you know. Uh, power, uh, absolute power uh, uh, corrupts. And, and people need to speak up in the sake for, for justice. And for the betterment of this world, because right now we're, we're going the opposite direction. Thank you so much for joining us, Gabe. Thank you so much, Jessica, for having me on the show. And as a reminder to our viewers, Chicago is the same city which has now lost La Casita and closed 50 public schools this year and fired thousands of teachers. Thank you so much for joining us.